of being in Venezuela a few weeks ago was to see how the media can construct an alternative reality. That we were in the country, and even though we saw a lot of, of suffering, we did see normal life. People getting up and going to work, and people going to their, doing what they're doing in the parks and, and all of that. But when you, we looked at how it was being covered back in the U.S., an image of mass chaos was being presented. Right. So we saw how that can happen, how effective that can be in mobilizing popular support for immoral and illegal actions. Um, this connection between uh, the media, the private media, uh, and the state is really a, a real uh, a nefarious one because the consequence of that is that uh, they are able to, to generate support for uh, actions that can only be characterized as criminal. Mm -hmm. um, and it's difficult for us to break through that, especially now as a consequence of Russian Gate, we see that uh, social media now is being openly censored. Yeah. Uh, the Black Alliance for Peace, for example, we put out a tweet uh, calling for peace in Venezuela and condemning uh, Juan Guaido, and we're told that uh, we have violated Twitter's uh, community standards. And we say, when does calling for peace violate some, some anybody's standards? But that is the kind of, of censorship now that we are facing. And so it's difficult for the American people to get a clear sense of what is happening uh, around the world. But the American people have to know, because innocence can no longer be tolerated, yeah. especially when your state is involved in a kind of global criminality that it is involved in, uh, in your name. So, you know, it's, it's time out now for innocence, and basically people have to know what's going on and be in opposition to it.